Welcome to this Sunday night edition of Riders Block Lab. I see you broke out. I'm guessing that's the obnoxious logo shirt. Is that the one yes, we, you referenced? Is, yes, this is the one that we talked about last week. And and Rex, just to just to have a little peek behind the curtain. Two hours ago, I put this shirt on because Russell Henley had a five-shot lead, lead at yeah. the Sony Open. I, I thought this was going to be my opportunity to gloat the same week that Georgia wins his first national championship in 41 years. Uh, I certainly have some regrets with my uh, certain attire on Sunday night. And you could have changed because we, we sat and watched. We, we waited it out. We, we needed to see how that was going to play out, and you, you chose not to. Very good. I, I'm it's, gonna... 10, it's, t it's 10 30 p.m. Eastern time. I wasn't going to change. I'm going to press forward. Now, you gave it away. Spoiler alert, Hideki Matsuyama did win in a playoff. And I was taken by the idea that that's some of the coolest situational golf that I have seen in a non-match play event. I mean, obviously, match play events are different. You're always going to respond to what your competitor is doing. But in that situation, because I was so fired up to see what Hideki was going to do on the 18th tee the second time, because he did his Bryson impersonation the first time around and he just crushed it i think he was 55 yards closer to the green than russell henley who of course teed off with a fairway wood and yet he completely changes his tune he decides to go with the i think he went with the rescue wood off the tee and just laces a three wood for what would be a walk off i, I was fascinated by all of that because it was such a good give and take that we don't see week in and week out on the pga tour rex this feels like the the new hideki you think of the way that he slammed the door at the Zozo Championship in the fall, I mean, playing in front of his home fans. He said that was more pressure than even coming down the stretch at Augusta National, uh, closing out his first Masters title, was winning that Zozo at home. He ended up winning by five shots. And the way that he played uh, on the weekend at Wiley, 63-63, and leading the field in in putting, it was crazy. And, and yeah. you think about the final hole in regulation, that, that very Bryson swing, and then in the playoff with kind of that no look from – 272 yards away to to kick in range uh, to seal the deal at the Sony Open. I, I mean, this feels like a player who is just brimming with confidence now. I, I think it, it the, the Masters victory certainly took a lot out of him. You saw kind of the uh, hangover effect over the following three or four months. This is a player now who knows that he can get it done in crunch time. And at age 29, I mean, the arrow is straight is pointing straight up for Hideki. And for me personally, you touched on it. Like this is much more than just the two victories. And he's the only player to have multiple victories on the PGA Tour. Very, very young season, but still it's worth pointing out. The part that really gets me curious going forward is the fact he led the field in strokes game putting. Because that's just not his thing. That we'll feels about like an anomaly. It feels like the exactly. same anomaly that Cam Smith leading the field in driving at Kapalua was, was Hideki Matsuyama gaining roughly seven and a half shots in the field uh, on the greens uh, this week at the Sony. No, no, I, I won't go that far because he won the Masters, and that's a putting contest. We know it. I mean, so it's in there. It's it's, it's somewhere. Not a putting contest anymore. It's a ball striking contest. It's it's he was able to put those greens well enough to win the Masters, and if you do that, then suddenly. And I look, I had to change my tune when Sergio Garcia won because I always just assumed that well, you know, he's one of the best. Which ball is further proof team. that it's not a putting contest anymore. Look at the last couple winners it's, of the Masters. It's, it's down the stripe. And Tiger Woods is the arguably the best iron player ever, and he won in twenty nineteen. Well, but then you go to Jordan Spieth. I mean, he didn't do it with his ball striking. He did it with his putting. So, I mean, we can what? sit here and go back and forth. Yeah, come on. Like, look at it statistically. He won the Masters the with his players for, for five years. Certainly that wasn't the case well, when he lost the Masters. So, you're going to lean on what he did when he won the Masters. But I will go was, back to the idea. That was, that was one bad swing. Yeah. That was one bad nine iron. One really bad swing. What I will keep going back to, though, it's deep down. It's there. I don't know if he's going to be able to produce this week in and week out on the PGA Tour. If he is, I think it would be something that you would want to watch going forward. Uh, Cass has turned the bar off, so that means he wants us to stop talking about this. But I do <laughs> want to ask just one more thing. If there's any chance you're going to circle back around and, and maybe make nice with Captain Immelman, who you two have been beefing. This is back-to-back -back wins for internationals. Hideki this week, Cameron Smith last week in Maui. Are you going to give the internationals even an outside chance? Are you going to try here? No, this doesn't change anything. I mean, nine. we still have nine months to go uh, until the tournament. Quill Hollow is not YLI. And Hideki Matsuyama, look, full credit, we just talked about it for four minutes, about how impressive that victory was. Who is the only potential U.S. Ryder Cupper that he beat in that field? Webb Simpson, who probably has an outside shot of making that U.S. team. Did you? It's been a very impressive start for the internationals. I still think they're going to lose by four or five points, but I certainly think uh, Captain Immelman is feeling good uh, on January 16th and 17th.
Oh, Trevor just texted you again. You may want to pick up on that. He's still, he's not happy with that answer either. All right, moving on. Netflix announced this week that they're going to create a docu-series on the PGA Tour players. It promises a lot of inside looks at the tour, promises a lot of different storylines that we don't know much about. Lab, I got to be honest with you. I really got into the Netflix series on Formula One. It got me to be something of a fan of Formula I think, One. I think everyone did. And that's largely yes. credited with the spike in popularity of, of Formula One. I don't know if that carries. I don't see apples to apples comparison here. And you may have a different opinion on this, but I don't see, I, I don't, the reason I think I like the Netflix special on Formula One is because one, I do feel like you're getting an inside look at what's happening. And two, I think there's legitimate beefs there. I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot of tension between certain drivers and that kind of made the series. I don't know if there's enough of that in golf to make this interesting. Look, I don't think the Netflix producers would have signed on for this docuseries if they weren't uh, given assurances from the PGA Tour players that they're courting, that they were going to be open and honest and reveal sides of themselves that, quite frankly, we haven't been seeing either on the Golf Channel or, or network telecasts uh, over the next over the last decade plus. Uh, I actually am uh, encouraged. And when you look at the who's who of, of guys who have signed up, I think it's really an intriguing list. I do think the stars of the series are going to be kind of that trifecta of, of Joel Dahman, uh, Harry Higgs, Max Homa. Homa. Those, yeah. those guys are going to be the stars of the series. But I am also really curious to see Rex Brooks Kepka. This is an unfiltered, uncensored format. He is not afraid to make enemies. He doesn't have all that many friends in the PJ Tour. I think he's going to be absolutely letting it rip. And I think he's going to be making the most headlines out of the series than any other player. You really think it's going to be uncensored? Like, yes, I, I, I just have my doubts. And, and you're right. I don't think Netflix would have signed on if they didn't have some sort of promise that, yes, this and is look, something. And look, you've, you've seen players who have said no. John Rahm, for whatever reason, said no. Phil Mickelson, mm -hmm. Tiger Woods, Bryson DeChambeau, uh, Patrick Cantley. They all turned down this opportunity. Well, Tiger guys, has a reason. He has agreements. Well, yes. Uh, other I mean, a couple of them do, yes. including Bryson, who has his own content creation company. Those guys uh -huh. turned it down for a reason. They don't want the uh, invasion of the cameras. The guys who did sign on, I think, are doing so with the understanding that they're going to have to show a different side of themselves. Speaking of the content creator himself, he spoke with the media this <laughs> week as part of a, a video conference getting ready for the Saudi International coming up next month. You and I were both on the conference the call. Only, the only time we get to talk to, to Bryson is when he's promoting the Saudi event. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, pretty much. And the only, the only time we can ask him the questions that we want to ask. Uh, give me the two things that stood out from you from that press conference. Uh, the first thing, look, Bryson was a WD, you have to remember, from the Sony Open. Uh, he cited some wrist soreness on Monday of tournament week. He said that is no big deal whatsoever. It's precautionary. He says that was kind of the brunt force uh, of really tuning up his speed training. Trauma. I think trauma uh, is the word. The trauma is for. exactly over the past couple of months. He said it's no big deal. He actually ar uh, added the Farmers Insurance Open uh, next week, a tournament that I'll be at. Uh, he called it, unfortunately, a good tune-up uh, for the Saudi event, which I'm not sure uh, is what Jay Monahan uh, wanted to hear. That was the first one. And second one, he was really vulnerable about what he went through, particularly in the back half of 2021. It was just a constant melodrama, uh, really encouraged by the Brooksy heckles that he received over the back half of the year. To hear how much that affected him, and, and I asked him, you know, he told the New York Post late last year that he actually considered stepping away from the game. Uh, how serious of a thought was that? Look, I don't think he was going to retire at the end of 2021, but I think it shows uh, just how vulnerable he is, just how precarious of a position he was. And he certainly seems like he's in a better place uh, as he kicks off his 2022 campaign. It was an interesting answer to what, what was obviously going to be a difficult answer for him because he clearly doesn't want to talk about this. But I will give him credit because honesty did come out. And you're right, it, it almost makes him seem much more sympathetic than I think a lot of people probably thought beforehand, simply because when you realize the depths of his despair, that he was willing to walk away from this one thing that he does better than almost anyone else in the world, this one craft that he's tried to protect since, I mean, perfect since I don't know when, you know, he's probably started walking is when he started thinking about these things. The fact that he was willing to give it all up, that shows a side of him that I didn't see. And the other thing that I, I found interesting is I asked him about the, the new rule this year on green reading material and the ban on green reading material. And I think we talked about this last week. And I don't know that it's really going to have that big of an impact on the PGA Tour as far as putting stats and scoring or anything else. 
but he is the one person I think it might impact. And he was, he was pretty honest there too. And it's clear he does not like the rule and he's going to have to figure out a way to make it work. Look, the Masters is the tournament which he has really struggled in. He The best finish that he's had uh, was when he was an amateur. He, and that's the only tournament, uh, major championship tournament, that does not allow uh, green reading books. And Rex, I, I'm not. I'm kind of curious your thought on this too. Do you feel like he's at odds right now with the PGA Tour? I feel like he he did not have the PGA Tour support until Jay Monahan stepped up at the Tour Championship and said that they were going to crack down on the fan behavior. I'm not sure he necessarily felt that support throughout the summer while he was kind of twisting in the wind, the green reading books with the Tour Policy Board, signing off on that change, trying to meet the minimum tournament. He mentioned that. He's he's never had a trouble uh, hitting 15 events uh, in a season. Now he's talking about the Saudi event and how much he's trying to grow the game there. What do you make of Bryson's current relationship with the Tour? I feel like he's at odds with everyone and that, that doesn't seem fair. And then <laughs> it's probably picking on him a little bit. And I don't like to pick on him because I feel like it's an easy sport, but yeah, I, I'm sure he did not like the way the tour handled the thing with Brooks. I'm sure he didn't like the idea that he was becoming this lightning rod and he's the one that was having people escorted off golf courses, not the PGA tour. They, they probably needed to step up earlier. I think he has a problem with the rule makers. I mean, I think this particular conversation about the green reading material was probably aimed more at the USG and the RNA. And look, he's had his problems with them in the past. And I think this is going to continue to come up. So I, I think he's got a lot of people right now that he has issues with. And certainly the PGA tour is on that list. He was doing a press conference for the Saudi international. And we all know how awkward that is going forward. I, I'm transitioning to one last topic. There was a beef, and you and I and the rest of the golf media, and really the golf world, feasted on Brooks and Bryson last year. And easy everything clicks. that went. Easy oh, clicks. easy clicks. Yes, yes. Low hanging fruit, a lot of, lot of easy headlines, a lot of easy blogs. We, we ran into something similar this week with Kevin Na and Grayson and Murray. And essentially, what happened is. Grayson called Kevin out essentially in a tweet talking about his slow play. And I, I, I have two it issues. It was egregiously slow, Rex. It and it, and it just, was slow. I think, <laughs> it, it, look, he is a habitual offender. And Kevin yeah. had a chance to shoot 59 in the opening round. I look, he's gotten faster. He was dreadfully slow in the no, opening No, no, and I'm not going to sit here and say he's round. not, not. A, a fast player. I will say this. I did a story last year because the, the tour changed their pace of play policy last year. And I talked to a lot of players and a lot of officials and all of them to a man pointed to Kevin Na as the reason they feel like this is going to work. Cause he has turned himself into what was a very slow player into a player that really isn't that way anymore. And I even had one. He's got to be living on that observation list, Rex. Uh, I don't think he is anymore. Or at least when I wrote this story, which was, he is, he is after the Sony, I can assure you. It, it, but it, regardless, it, it was misplaced. I don't think it's fair anymore to Kevin. I think he is trying and he has made improvements. That's not really the part that I was taken with. I, again, I'll go back to last summer and the Brooks and Bryson thing. I, I didn't feel comfortable reading this. I didn't feel comfortable reading these exchanges. And, and again, the headlines and the easy clicks. Oh, you've it, gone soft. Well, no, because we all know the background behind Grayson Murray, do we not? You, you know it better than most golf writers because you've written about it. I mean, he has been very, very open talking about his struggles with mental health. And he is not playing golf right now, essentially, because of these struggles. And I know what Kevin was doing. He was just defending himself. But in the heat of the moment, I, I did not feel good about this. It, the, the, when you use that type of context, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look good. However, Grayson Murray still has access to his Twitter account. His agent could take it away if he felt that that was going to be a liability uh, for him. However, I think this is also the dangers of living in this PIP era where everyone wants a piece of the pie. And when you have one of the metrics being social media engagement, which would then drive web traffic, which could then drive all those other various uh, factors that are that are going to be uh, eventually leading to your pip score yeah you're going to see these types of pot shots you're going to see players getting themselves out there on the twitter on the, in, the, in these twitter in these twitter streets and potentially starting wars that's the name of the game i don't think the pj tour is necessarily afraid of it either no i don't think so either and again i think uh, i'm a fan of any time that you Again, we just talked about a Netflix special. Well, we all we want to see the inside scoop on all of these players. In this particular case, though, again, knowing what we knew about Grayson, I didn't feel that like that puts him in a very good spot. I feel like it's almost right, like so. A if, so, if, so if Kevin Na was was feuding with Adam Svensson, who was oh, I'm fine with that. In that'd the next fifty yeah, that'd, holes, yeah, yeah, so you're, you're 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 fine with that. Yes, yes. This has everything to do with what we know about Grayson and knowing what we do about mental health now in sports. I, I think. 
it, it came to a light last year, and I think it's only going to continue to come to a light. And when you put someone in this particular situation, and I'm not telling Kevin he can't defend himself. I'm just saying for me personally, I walked away feeling a little dirty, felt like I had to take a shower. Yeah. I mean, I certainly – I think Grayson Murray needs to be careful, and I hope he continues to make progress. The, the progress that I've heard uh, from people in his camp has been very encouraging. Maybe this was just him – poking fun at, at one of his peers and it ended up turning a little bit ugly in the, in the internet wars. All right. I'm gonna let our favorite bulldog fan go to sleep. It is late on a Sunday night. Check us out. We will be previewing the American express on You're Wednesday. Gonna be there. Thursday gonna be morning. I will be there. I will be live. So check it out. See you next time.